Good morning. I'm Dr. Phyllis Bilia from the Peter Monk Cardiac Center, and I'll be talking to you about echo ramp studies to guide weaning of patients from ECMO support. I have nothing to disclose. My tasks today are to discuss the role of echo in weaning from ECMO support and how to integrate this information with other clinical data, as well as to discuss some of the pitfalls and diagnostic challenges that we face. There are two separate issues when we're looking at after patients that are supported with VA ECMO. The first one is when should patients be considered for decannulation? And I think that this is a daily assessment. Second is how to assess for decannulation, and that is with a weaning trial. However, before proceeding towards concept, the conception of decannulation, effort has to be made to optimize the patient, and you have to demonstrate that there's evidence of clinical stability. That would include no evidence of compounding factors, such as uh, the presence of tamponade, bleeding, distension of the LV, for example. And the patient should be on optimal vent settings. And the timing of decannulation can also be affected by complications acquired while on ECMO support, such as serious bleeding, either from the cannula sites or elsewhere, and other complications would include development of ischemic limbs and or strokes. Clinical stability is demonstrated by the following parameters. Resolution of the pulmonary edema, normalization of lactate, and improvement of end organ function. In addition, patients should only require minimal vasoactive support to maintain a mean arterial pressure of greater than 65 millimeters of mercury. They should be on minimal vent settings, and the pulse pressure should be greater than 20 millimeters of mercury. This would indicate that there is evidence of some degree of LV ejection. ELSA also states that before attempting weaning, there should be signs of biventricular recovery and they suggest assessment of aortic pulsatility and myocardial contraction for recovery in addition to end organ recovery. This is where echo is key. <clears throat> but the problem is that there are no guidelines with respect to how often one should image these patients. And having looked after enough patients by now, my message to you would be to use Echocardiography is a daily assessment tool for looking for the potential for ventricular recovery and to rule out complications that would change the course of treatment. Uh, one thing to keep in mind in relation to decannulation and liberation from ECMO is that while that this may seem to be a binary outcome of whether or not a patient is decannulated, and this is clinically important, this outcome alone is potentially more reflective of patient selection as opposed to lib the liberation process itself or, th or the protocol used. Some of the strongest determinants for high success rate in removal from ECMO comes from the presence or absence of unmodifiable factors, making this difficult to integrate it into liberation protocols. And some of the unmodifiable factors that I'm referring to would include age and comorbidities, such as ischemic heart disease, diabetes, and chronic kidney disease. And the presence of these factors does pretend worse long-term outcomes, as do clinical characteristics at the time of cannulation, such as acid-bait disturbances and acute renal or liver dysfunction. And then there is the recovery of the biventricular function. This is critical to success. In clinical practice, the removal of any tempor uh, temporary support must take into account the hemodynamic effects of both the right ventricle and the left ventricle as support is slowly withdrawn. Looking at the LV is obvious, but as ECMO support is weaned, RV function is no less important in determining a patient's course in the bridge to the next step, and this is where echo is crucial. Let's consider a patient being supported by VA ECMO. We know that VA ECMO flows increases afterload and decreases preload, and as such, intrinsic LV function is marked uh, is masked, sorry, at flow, flow, uh, full flows. Therefore, a period of lower support to fully assess the patient's hemodynamics and clinical status is needed. Consideration of weaning should be done as part of daily rounds, but also thought should be given to the safety and utility of doing it on that particular day. Overall, the aim is to optimize the patient's clinical state as much as possible before considering weaning, and then um, decisions about weaning may vary um, <clears throat> and are likely a combination of the circuit factors, which we won't discuss uh, um, further in this talk, by chemical parameters that you see in the blood work, renal function, lactate, um, liver function, to name a few, 
Um, also hemodynamic data uh, with the use of an arterial line to provide pulse pressure, pulsatility, and mean arterial blood pressure. And finally, a pulmonary arterial catheter. The use of a PA catheter is controversial in some centers. And the last but not the least is, is a, an important way to monitor these two patients is by echocardiography. There have been some parameters that have been shown to predict success for decannulation, and I will try to show you some of that data <clears throat> a bit later in the talk. Why is it important to wean as soon as possible? This is related to the accrual of an opportunity for complications while a patient is cannulated and receiving ECMO support. The complication rate is not small, and some of them portend a worse prognosis and make support futile. Others are a result of the hypotension associated with the presentation of cardiogenic shock, such as renal replacement therapy. And a longer support that is greater than four days is associated with the higher mortality. Weaning from ECMO support should be considered as part of a patient's journey rather than the specific outcome. Goals of weaning will vary with the exit strategy, and the exit strategy should be defined before proceeding. At the Peter Monk Cardiac Center, we start with the process ensuring a few of the things that I've already mentioned that relate to clinical stability, improvement in cardiac function alone for viability, pulsatility with evidence of the aortic valve opening, lower dose of vasopressor support, and improvement in <clears throat> and organ function. And if there are no confounding variables, we then assess for recovery with echo, looking at LVOT, VTI, ejection fraction, tricuspid S prime, and assess the RV when we can. I say when we can because the assessment of the RV is complex and in situations where transesophageal echocardiography is not being used, the patients cannot be optimally positioned, suboptimal images can be uh, common. Having said that, if we see that, that we have the criteria outlined as shown in the blue box, then uh, we would reduce the flows by 50% for 30 minutes and redo the echo. Following that, again, if we see that we're moving in the right direction and we have the goals out, as outlined below, um, we then would um, uh, reduce the flows to a minimum First, reduce the flows by 25% further, and then repeat the echo, and then do uh, reduce the flows to minimally allowable flows. We also assess the RV along this route with a trial of volume if needed and inotropic challenge uh, to see if we can improve RV function and see if there is recruitable work that can be done by the right, right ventricle. In these patients, echocardiography, particularly serial echoes, is an incredibly important component of management of patients supported with ECMO because it allows us to assess so many important parameters that will affect management, such as um, <clears throat> providing information on chamber sizes as a surrogate of LV decompression, aortic valve excursion as um, a surrogate for severity of of uh, contractile dysfunction, the presence or absence of intracardiac or aortic group thrombus, aortic valvular, uh, sorry, valvular regurgitation, and pericardial effusion with, with uh, or without tamponade. Finally, it allows us to look at cannula position, which is uh, problematic um, when, um, when we see that flows are dropping with no other explanation. Transthoracic echo can confirm cannula placement and identify certain causes of circuit obstruction, but transthoracic echo may also fail to provide adequate septal spatial re resolution, and in these cases, transesophageal echocardiography should be considered. Things that affect the performance of a transthoracic echo include presence of chest tubes making good, get, getting good acoustic windows difficult, ventilator interference, and restriction in the positioning of the patient. When transthoracic echo is problematic, therefore, because of the poor acoustic windows or clots are suspected, transesophageal echo is then preferred. However, I do have to say that there are, when there are good windows with transthoracic echo, I do start that with that as our, my first approach. This figure is great in that it highlights the main TEE views used to assess hemodynamics in sick patients, not just those supported by VA ECMO, and it shows the types of images we can acquire 
with the progression of the tip of the probe from the upper esophagus into the stomach. If we look at the level of the upper esophagus, we have a view of the great vessels on the left. The middle panel shows us the MO to demonstrate the respiratory variation of the superior vena cava. Um, and then at the level of the metesophagus, at 40 degrees, we can easily find the aortic tricuspid and pulmonary valves, as well as the right atrium and right ventricle on the left panel. The middle panel shows us the view at 20 degrees with the left ventricular alpha tract and both aortic um, and mitral valves. And on the right panel at 20 to 60 degrees, we can now assess for tricuspid regurgitation. We have here a four-chamber view on the left, a two-chamber view in the middle, and both uh, left and right ventricular systolic function and size can be assessed, and the mitral inflow on the right. And finally, in the transgastric views, we have the short axis view of the heart to assess left ventricular systolic function and interventricular septal motion as seen on the extreme left. And then at 120 degrees, we can measure Doppler velocities in the LVOT tract, middle left panel, uh, and the arrow indicates uh, where, um, which gives us time velocity integral reflecting stroke volume, which is the middle right panel. To assess repertory variation of maximal Doppler velocity, we use this as an index of, of uh, fluid responsiveness, which is on the extreme right. The place where there's a role in addition to this uh, for VA ECMO is in relation to the cannula placement. And this is seen quite nicely from the T, this is not a TEE on the left, rather it is a transthoracic study to show us the placement of the cannula <coughs> from the groin with the, mouth, uh, with the mouth of the cannula at the junction between the IVC and the right atrium. But also it's important to be able to look for clots. Smoke uh, is as shown here on the second case, and this is done by transesophageal echocardiography. The aortic valve is not opening in this study, and there is stasis of blood in the LVOT, which is a concern for very early clot formation. Let's talk about a case. <clears throat> This is a case of a 34-year-old man with Bechet's muscular dystrophy who presented with cardiogenic shock. The upper row of images are transesophageal images acquired at the time of cannulation. The lower row are transthoracic images at five or six days later. <clears throat> the cannula placement, sorry, if we look at the time of cannulation, it is evident that there is severe biventricular failure as seen in the upper left panel. The cannula placement is confirmed in the upper middle panel where we see the cannula from the peripheral site traveling from the IVC to the opening of the SVC. And in addition, this patient needed a septostomy and this shows so nicely in the top right panel where we have flow created from the septostomy. The cannula here is not well seen. Five to six days later, the TE was repeated and we started to see recovery of the RV function, but not LV function. And the LVOT VTI is suboptimal at 6.5 centimeters, while the TAPSI is 1.2 centimeters. About a week later, a ramp study was performed. These are clusters of four echo images on the left, which are baseline at 2300 RPMs, which provided almost two liters per minute of flow. However, the TAPSI VTI and TS prime are not optimal, but the RV function has improved as compared to the initial cannulation. When the speed is reduced and the flow dropped to as low as possible at 0.6 liters per minute, the only parameter that changed was this TS prime by 50%. There has been some observational studies that have discussed the utility of using specific echo parameters to predict success from weaning from VA ECMO support. The importance of improvement in the RV RV function cannot be understated. Some groups have shown less RV failure in those patients surviving weaning from VA ECMO, and some of the key parameters for that include 3D RV ejection fraction, which has the highest predictive value for success and a cutoff of 25%, and other RV parameters would include RV free wall strain, RV fractional area change, 
and all of these seem to be additive to the assessment of the right ventricular ejection fraction. But from a practical perspective, obtaining the types of echo images that are required can be problematic. To extend this out further, a paper was published last year in JACE from a group in Korea. This paper was a detailed echo assessment of parameters that change as patients were being assessed for weaning with a reduction in speeds as recommended by ELSO. They did this for 92 patients and interestingly two-thirds of the patients were weaned from ECMO successfully. And from this analysis we were able to identify specific echo parameters that met with success, namely LVOT VTI, lateral E prime, and indicators of RV function, namely tricuspid valve S prime and RV fractional area change. And we're looking at a change of 50% increase in these measured parameters. Conventional parameters would include an ejection fraction of the left ventricle greater than 20%, an LV VTI greater than 10 centimeters, and a mitral annulus S prime greater than six centimeters per second. This paper added to those initial values, but stated that the percentage change that is predicted for with weaning is a 50% increase in lateral E prime, a 50% increase in uh, LVOT VTI, and a 25% increase in the tricuspid S prime, as well as a 10% increase in the fractional area change of the RV. In the same study, we see that uh, that using the traditional criteria was not that predictive of successful weaning for ECMO. With the addition now in the percentage change of the lateral E prime and the tricuspid uh, S prime, we now start to see that the presence of both of these parameters leads, leads to a 80% of patients being successfully weaned. With respect to the need for monitoring, we also need to consider complications. And what we're showing here are transesophageal echo images, which uh, shows the presence of clot. On the left are uh, associations of clot with the aortic valve on the top, the um, uh, proximal aorta on the bottom, and then with septostomies and the cannulas left and present in, in the left atrium, we can see clot formation on the tip of the cannula in two separate views of the same patient. Microbubbles have also been validated as a safe and effective method to evaluate cardiac chamber um, um, size and function and to rule out cardiac masses or thrombi in, difficult, in technically difficult studies. There's limited information on the utility and the safety of contrast in ECMO patients. However, I did find an abstract from the Mayo Clinic that looked at their experience from 2001 to 2016 and, cl and in close to um, 2,000 echoes that were performed, Definity Contrast was used only four times with no serious issues. The circuit alarmed one out of the four times, but the flow didn't stop. And with the use of contrast, they were able to detect thrombus and intracardiac clot in three out of the four studies. Sometimes you can use echo contrast like Definity to help with, with this, but there is very little data other than this that I could find on the safety and utility of this approach. <clears throat> in real world experience, we are limited, each of us, by what we do at our institutions and the patient related factors that may allow for good imaging. There can be limitations to using ECHO to evaluate hemodynamics in critically ill patients supported by ECMO. And there's no standard criteria for recovery or for helping to assist in timing of weaning. As already stated, the improvement of LVEF or VTI through the LVOT are the initial parameters. However, assessment of the LVEF can be subjective and there is high intra-observer variability. Also, preload is changing according to ECMO flow. Therefore, preload sensitive variables such as EF and VTI may not represent contractility of the native heart. The RV has also an important role in the process of ECMO weaning, as uh, we've already spoken about. And uh, um, it's, it's important to assess the RV as, as much as possible so that um, we can then have some <clears throat> evidence of feasibility of weaning um, once decannulated. Patients with premature RV and, uh, and LV recovery are likely to experience some deterioration of RV function after ECMO weaning. And as the ECMO flows are reduced during the weaning process, the RV has to adapt to increase v, uh, RV preload, 
The prematurely recovered RE may not tolerate this. And for those patients with premature LV recovery, reducing ECMO flows could result in increased PA arterial pressures, which then leads to increased RV afterload. In summary then, weaning, I think, should be considered on a daily basis. I think it's critical to optimize the patient prior to thinking about weaning from ECMO strategies. And ECHO is definitely a critical part of this assessment for readiness for weaning from ECMO support. I think that there is utility in using both transesophageal and transthoracic surveillance for intracardiac complications as, and should be used as necessary. And the principles of weaning protocols that we discussed um, are currently based on echo parameters, but there's a lot more work that needs to be done.